Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. We've all seen SpaceX land the first stage of their Falcon 9 rocket, and now Elon Musk says he wants to try to land the second stage. In order to understand why his engineers were probably crapping their pants when he said this, we're going to explain why recovering something from orbit is significantly harder than recovering the first stage. We're also going to show you some options for second stage reuse, including one option to just keep it up in space where it might be better used than back here on Earth. Now bear with me on this one. It's going to be a little bit more technical and a little bit longer, but with a little help from Kerbal Space Program, I think we'll be just fine. Three, two, one, zero, and SpaceX has gotten so good at recovering the first stage of their Falcon 9 that we forget how almost impossibly hard it is. Right up until they actually landed their first first stage on December 21st, 2015 for mission Orbcom 2, it was still thought by most people in the industry to be simply impossible. We've previously talked extensively about how SpaceX lands and also got into some fundamentals determining if they'll have enough margins to land their Falcon 9 on land or on the drone ship in the ocean. So if you don't understand those things, please check out those videos before watching this one. This one's going to be a little bit more technical, but I promise we're going to try to make it as easy as possible. So let's start off with a few numbers before we get into some examples. The first stage of a typical Falcon 9 will get up to speeds around 5,000 miles per hour, which is about 2.3 kilometers per second. As you hopefully are aware, even at this speed, the first stage still needs to do a fairly substantial entry burn as the stage enters the atmosphere, so the heat of re-entry does not tear the stage apart. This requires the first stage to use up a portion of its already scarce fuel in order to survive hitting the atmosphere. The second stage, on the other hand, is traveling much, much faster. An object in low Earth orbit is traveling at around 17,500 miles per hour or 7.8 kilometers per second. Then we have missions where the second stage needs to loft its payload up to geostationary transfer orbit. This requires it reaches speeds of 22,000 miles per hour or 9.8 kilometers per second. So as you can see, depending on the destination of the payload, the second stage may end up traveling up to four times faster than the first stage. This is a big problem when trying to recover it. The primary reason being heat on re-entry increases by speed cubed. Or in other words, this means if re-entry of the vehicle goes from two kilometers per second to eight kilometers per second, the heat would increase by 64 times. So now I hear you saying, but we bring stuff down from space all the time. Why is this any different? To answer that question, let's take a look at some common re-entry systems. We'll start with what's probably the most common, a capsule. The reason a capsule works so well is because it's the simplest, safest, and most stable of all designs. The blunt leading edge and tapered walls create an exceptional environment to dissipate heat and stay pointing heat shield first. Next most common is what the space shuttle was, a lifting body. A lifting body allows for the vehicle to stay in the upper atmosphere longer, allowing the vehicle to slow down for a longer period of time which keeps peak heating and g-forces to a minimum. This also allows for a lot of control when coming in, so the space shuttle and others like it have a great cross-range capability, leading to flexibility and reliability in hitting its intended landing areas. The space shuttle isn't the only lifting body used. There's the upcoming Dream Chaser by Sierra Nevada and Boeing's Secretive X-37B, both of which sort of look like mini space shuttles. They're similar by concept, but are even more of a lifting body since they don't have delta wings like the space shuttle did. And lastly, although not currently used for orbital flights here on Earth, is using retro propulsion like SpaceX uses for the first stage. The primary reason we can't use retro propulsion is because it would take just as much fuel to slow the vehicle down prior to re-entry as it took to speed the vehicle up to orbital speeds. This means even after the second stage has completed its long burn to speed up, it would have to somehow have enough fuel to turn around and do that entire burn again, which just simply isn't happening. Some of the other major problems facing second stage re-entry is stability. The vehicle will want to enter heavy end first, or in the case of an almost empty second stage, engine first. Say we put a heat shield up on the top of the stage, it would take some serious design considerations for that vehicle to maintain its proper heat shield first orientation during re-entry. Believe it or not, SpaceX actually released this video in 2011, which showed the second stage with a heat shield on the front of it. Another issue is when it comes to landing. The second stage cannot simply use its engine at sea level. With its massive nozzle, it would be too unstable at sea level, meaning we can't actually use the Falcon 9's vacuum Merlin engine for its final landing. 
but perhaps the biggest enemy is weight. Sure, we can solve any of these issues if we tack on a spare set of engines for landing, a set of wings for orientation, additional thrusters for maneuvering, a heat shield to survive re-entry, and some landing gear. The problem here is for each pound we add to that second stage, we have to remove a pound from the payload. By the time we add all this new hardware, there's a chance we won't have any margin for payload at all. Think about it, the second stage pushes its payload all the way to its intended destination. All of the mass of the second stage is literally joined to the payload right up until the mission is complete and it lets go of that payload. This is different from the first stage. The first stage doesn't take nearly as much of a payload penalty for each pound added. Elon Musk quoted it's only about a 5 to 1 ratio for the first stage. This means they could add about 5 pounds to the first stage before you have to remove 1 pound from the payload. This is why the first stage of the Falcon 9 can have large landing gear, nitrogen thrusters, and grid fins, and still put a substantial payload into orbit. So let's take this over to the computer game Kerbal Space Program, where I've set up some examples of how SpaceX just might pursue second stage reuse, and just how hard it actually is. Alright, so we're here inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kerbal Space Center, and I'm building a rocket that's similar to the Falcon 9. We're gonna call it the Falcor 5. For those of you unfamiliar with Kerbal Space Program, it's basically a game slash simulator that will suck the life out of you. Do you have a significant other? Do you want to keep that significant other? If the answer is yes, then you should not play Kerbal Space Program. It is that addicting. Because we want this to be somewhat realistic, I cranked the gravity up two times in this game, so this will make our margins a little bit thinner and that much more realistic. Our payload for this mission is the start of a new space station, and it weighs 4.8 metric tons. With this bog standard Falcor 5, it will just barely be able to push this thing up into low carbon orbit at an altitude of about 250 kilometers. So that will leave us with only enough remaining fuel to deorbit ourselves, and that's it. Now for reference sake only, do notice that the vehicle is showing us having 7,828 meters per second of delta V. This is only a reference. This doesn't really line up to anything kind of in, in real life, and it doesn't really line up to most things in Kerbal, but we're going to use that as we change the mission profile later. We're just gonna remember what we started off with. Okay, let's put this baby out on the pad. Full disclosure, I'm using a mod called MechJeb, which will actually fly the rocket for me. Uh, it's not very fun, but at least it'll keep all of our missions exactly consistent, and it will compare apples to apples, so that we kind of eliminate the variable of me flying it. All right, here we are. We're loaded up on the launch pad, ready to go. All systems go. Three, two, one, hip, hip. All right, I'm gonna speed this up because we're gonna be doing this many times and I don't wanna have to watch every single second of every single mission. All right, here's our gravity turn and there's max Q. And now we have stage separation. That first stage has enough fuel to try to land, uh, fairing deploy. And now you can see we're getting into orbit. All right, now we're gonna coast up to its highest point or apogee and do one more burn to circularize. So that'll put us parked in our 250 kilometer orbit. And now let's deploy our payload. Okay, it's good to go. Now notice how little fuel we have left. This was at the absolute upper end of what our standard Falcor 5 is capable of pushing into orbit. So we're gonna do our deorbit burn and we're gonna get down to about 50 kilometers into the atmosphere so it blows up on re-entry. And there we go, kaboomy. So now we have two options. Since we had literally no fuel remaining to attempt any kind of recovery at all, we can either do one of two things. We can shrink the payload down or we can build a bigger rocket. I think we all know the answer to this one. Introducing the Falcor Heavy. Okay, so we're putting that exact same payload, that space station, up into the same place in space in the same orbit. But now we're actually starting off with 9,296 meters per second of delta V, as opposed to just 7,937 meters per second. So let's see how much fuel we have remaining at the end of this mission to see if we have any chance of recovering the second stage at all. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, hip, hip. All right, gravity turn, max Q. Those side boosters deploy and they have enough fuel to land back at land. Now the center core, when it separates, that will have to try to land out at sea on the drone ship. Okay, now we're going to get into orbit. Let's see how we're doing. Okay, so the payload deploys and we still have a decent amount of fuel. Let's see how much fuel we have left over and try to recover the second stage after our deorbit burn. Okay, so we have just over 1200 meters per second of Delta V to slow ourselves down as we enter the atmosphere. 
Now as the stage heats up, I'm gonna throttle up to help slow ourselves down so the compression from the free stream air behind the bow shock doesn't heat us up too much. It's a lot of technical stuff, but basically that's the stuff that'll kill us. After good entry burn, we still have around 400 meters per second left over. Uh, will this be enough to slow us down as we get into denser atmosphere? Uh, throttle back up. Uh, no, bye bye. There she goes. So uh, we just simply cannot slow ourselves down enough. So just as we had talked about earlier, we'd need to slow ourselves down enough to survive re-entry, which we just simply don't have the margins to do. So let's use that atmosphere to our advantage. Let's take a big old heat shield up on the nose of that stage, and then we'll try to point it nose first as it goes through the atmosphere to slow us down. Our biggest problem here is we know that engine is going to want to go first because it's the most massive part of that stage. So we're gonna try to keep it oriented using those thrusters and stuff like that, but we'll see how it works. Let's check this out. And voila, we now have a large heat shield at the nose of the second stage. See that beautiful pizza crust looking thing? Oh yeah, there it is. Between the second stage and the payload, it is just delicious. We're gonna go ahead and skip to payload deploy and watch our re-entry. Now notice after our deorbit burn, we're left with only 675 meters per second. Having to push around that big heavy heat shield really took its toll. So now we had 1200 meters per second on that last re-entry. So hopefully we won't need to use our engines at all to slow us down, so let's see how this goes. Okay, so our RCS thrusters are keeping us oriented. Nose first, heating up, it's getting spicy. Oh, oh shoot, yeah, there we go. And that's what happens. The RCS thrusters were not strong enough to keep it oriented. It would take a, a lot of RCS thrusters to keep it oriented like that. Okay, it's time to get serious. That last attempt didn't even have an engine that could land on sea level anyway, or landing gear. So let's go all in on this one. Okay, I'm adding fins for stability some separate engines to land with, and some large landing gear that will allow us to land upside down. Now again, this is only for reference, but by the time we add all this recovery hardware onto the second stage, we're looking at only 8,093 meters per second of delta V. That's a ways down from the 9,296 meters per second that the original Falcor Heavy had. Okay, so we're gonna put this into orbit and deploy the payload. Let's see how things go on re-entry. Well, look at that, those fins are keeping it oriented heat shield first. Y yikes. Oh. Ooh. Wow, okay, they're barely keeping it oriented. Okay. E okay, we only have 100 meters per second left over to land with. We're traveling over 200 meters per second. I can see where this one's going. Into the drink. Boo! So remember before when we had to decide to make either a smaller payload or a bigger rocket? Uh, let's make a smaller payload on this one. Introducing a large telecommunications satellite that weighs in exactly half the mass of the space station piece at just 2.4 metric tons. We're only showing 8,219 meters per second, which is up from that 8,093 meters per second we had with that larger payload. But the interesting note here is we won't have to use as much going up, so it does mean we'll have a decent amount more to work with on the way down. Okay, so boom, we're in orbit, payload deploy, and now we're deorbiting. Okay, much better. We now have 605 meters per second left over to try to recover this baby. Ooh, that's a spicy meatball. Okay, and let's and flip it over here. Oh. Whoa, we're getting real spicy down here. And... All right, let's do our landing burn here. And full throttle. And... Touchdown, yeah! Oh, that took me way too long. I don't wanna tell you how many times. Okay, now don't forget, Kerbal is not a perfect analog but at least helps illustrate some of the challenges involved in trying to recover a second stage. Okay, so moral of the story is, yes, there is a potential to land the second stage. It isn't impossible. It will require some major design changes, and even if they are to get it to be recoverable, there might be such little remaining margins that they might not be able to launch a significant payload. They might end up using a Falcon Heavy to launch CubeSats or something, all for the sake of reusing the second stage, which just would not be economical. 
Only time will tell, and I'm really excited to see what they come up with for their solution. Now before the comments get blown up with, but the space shuttle, I did want to point out that the orbiter portion of the space shuttle was essentially a recoverable second stage. It fully succeeded in bringing home those expensive and wonderful RS-25 main engines. The problem is, it took such a big payload penalty. Despite having almost the same amount of thrust at sea level, the space shuttle could only put a 28,000 kilogram payload into orbit, which is nothing compared to the Saturn V, which could put 120,000 kilograms into low Earth orbit. This is because about 100 kilograms of weight was the orbiter itself. With its wings and engines, cargo bay, and landing gear, this greatly reduced how heavy of a payload it could actually deliver. Now I did mention there's another proposal for keeping a second stage in orbit and reusing it while it's up there. United Launch Alliance, better known as ULA, which is a joint venture between Boeing and Lockheed Martin, has a really cool idea for the second stage of their upcoming Vulcan rocket. They propose the idea that why try and bring a second stage back down at all? Why not keep them in orbit and eventually they can populate a large number of second stages with some extra fuel in them? Then they would be able to dock and top off a single stage so you could eventually have a full second stage sitting in orbit, waiting to be used. This means you could push a substantial payload way beyond Earth orbit on just the fumes of otherwise doomed stages. It's a pretty brilliant idea, and I'm excited to see them work on this concept. Unfortunately, we won't see the Advanced Cryogenic Evolve stage, or ACES, fly until 2023 at the earliest. Regardless, it's really exciting to see companies taking this stuff seriously. My hope is that within the next decade, we're going to see fully reusable rockets that will help bring the cost of space down significantly. That will be a really exciting time. If you have any other questions about second stage reuse or any other questions about rockets at all, leave them in the comments below. Make sure and hit subscribe so you know when I make more fun, funny, and factual content. Be sure and check out my web store where you can find cool shirts, some hats, some mugs, a print, and lots of other fun stuff. EverydayAstronaut.com Another great way to help support is through Patreon. A huge shout out to those that do support me on Patreon. You can help contribute by visiting Patreon.com slash EverydayAstronaut. As always, all the music in the background of my videos is music that I write and post on my SoundCloud account. If you want to just check it out, do it. SoundCloud.com slash EverydayAstronaut. Well, that does it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.